Hey there folks, if you've followed this channel for some time, then you may recognize this case. It was presented back when it happened in 2020, and even then, it was a case I was really fascinated with. Since 2020, I've learned quite a bit more about this case, and that is what this video will present. When trying to discern why a disappearance happens, I think the topic of mental health can often be overlooked, or at least, is not often discussed. It's a topic that I think rears its head in this case, which, as with most cases on this channel, is being presented with a purpose to educate people about disappearances and the reasons they occur. This particular disappearance is unique because we get some insight into the thoughts and behaviors of the individual leading up until the point they disappear, and even after that. Eighteen-year-old Giovanna Gia Fuda lived with her parents Kristen and Bob as well as brother Dominic in Maple Valley, Washington. Gia had recently graduated from Tahoma High School, and in July of 2020 she was unemployed but taking summer classes online at Bellevue College. In 2004, when Gia was only a couple of years old, her 18-year-old stepsister, Kali Fuda, was struck by an Amtrak train and killed in a tragic accident. Though she was young, the incident appears to have had a lasting effect on Gia. Gia also maintained a presence on social media websites like Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, where she would post videos and talk to friends. On July 24, 2020, Gia would leave her home in Maple Valley at around 8 in the morning. She took her 2008 Toyota Corolla and did not tell anyone in her family where she was going. When Gia did not return home that night, her parents began getting concerned as they were unable to reach her via calling or texts. On July 5th, 2020, Gia's parents, Kristen and Bob, reported her as missing to the King County Sheriff's Office. At the time, deputies note that calls to Gia's cell phone would go straight to voicemail. Her parents reported she was on no medications and had no history of drugs, alcohol, prostitution, or any history of self-harm attempts. Gia's mother, Kristen, however, indicated that Gia had been behaving erratically lately and that her disappearance was extremely out of character. They said that Gia never responded to any calls or texts they had sent in the prior 24 hours and showed no activity on her social media. Bob Fuda had even reached out to a number of Gia's friends, but none of them were able to get in touch with her either. Bob told deputies that Gia had had several mood swings lately, from being very social and happy to not talking to anyone and isolating herself. Bob said that she had struggled with ideas of self-harm in the past, but he wasn't aware of any within the last few years. He noted that Gia recently collected several pictures of her deceased stepsister and had been looking at them for several days. Deputies learned that Gia was last seen wearing a red sweatshirt with blue jeans and a black backpack. At the same time, the sheriff's office also received information from a second reporting party, a man named Eddie Goodman who was a friend of Gia. He told authorities that he thought Gia might be traveling to Sacramento, California to see a male friend named Jeremy and also had some text messages that supported this. Gia's Toyota Corolla would be found by Washington State Department of Transportation that same day, July 25th, at around 7 p.m. It was located on Highway 2 in the Cascade Mountains, east of the town of Skykomish, and near a rail yard. The vehicle was parked on the shoulder of the road, with Gia's purse and other items still inside the car cab. The Toyota was then impounded so that it could be thoroughly searched, and it was later determined that the car had run out of gas. There was nothing in the car that indicated Gia might have gone hiking, and also nothing suspicious. Many items were found in the vehicle, including Gia's purse, ID, multiple pairs of sunglasses, a black gym bag, soccer equipment, clothing, hygiene items, books, and what appears to be a pamphlet from the memorial for her stepsister, Kali. Detectives also swabbed the steering wheel and gear shifter so they could be tested for DNA. Gia's parents were puzzled by the location of her vehicle, as Gia was not familiar with the Stevens Pass area. 
This region is also a cell phone dead zone, so even if Gia had her phone, she would have been unable to send or receive calls. The sheriff's office subsequently sent out a media release asking for tips from people who may have been driving in the area around the time Gia went missing. Many people would end up sending in their dash cam footage to the sheriff's office. Some of them captured Gia's vehicle parked near Highway 2, but none of the footage really helped detectives further the investigation or assist in finding her. The sheriff also received many tips about the case, including from psychics claiming they knew what happened. Some tips hinted that Gia may have been picked up by human traffickers. Afterwards, the investigation immediately took a two-pronged approach with one group physically searching in and around the area where Gia's car was found. They set up a base camp at the rail yard located off of Highway 2 and began searching along the roadsides. The other group began looking into the possibility of foul play or criminal activity. Early on, the King County Sheriff described the disappearance as suspicious. All of the facts up to that time seemed to point to a possible abduction scenario. That being the case, detectives began to search for potential suspects. On July 26th, detectives followed up on the lead that Gia may be traveling to Sacramento, California to see a male friend by the name of Jeremy. They were able to get in touch with Jeremy who said that he dated Gia a couple years ago and that they had a dysfunctional long-distance relationship. He had not seen her in person since August of 2018. When asked about the last time he talked with Gia, Jeremy said that he had seen a post on her Instagram saying that she was going to visit him in California. So he called her around 5.30 in the morning, the day she disappeared, to find out what she was talking about. He told detectives that Gia did not sound right and he thought she might have been on drugs or having mental issues. They also exchanged messages on Instagram, which he described as bizarre. Reviewing the messages, they certainly don't make much sense with seemingly random words and lots of emojis. Jeremy told authorities that when they dated, she was not the type to be using any kind of illegal drugs. When detectives asked Jeremy where he thinks Gia might have gone, he stated that she enjoyed hiking and may have gone into the woods to clear her mind. On July 28th, detectives began looking for gas stations between Sky Comish and Leavenworth in order to obtain potential surveillance footage of Gia being in those areas. They also went to Gia's home and spoke with her parents about her daily habits and friends. While they were there, detectives also looked around in Gia's room where they noticed she had laid out some meaningful items on her bed in a sort of display. This included pictures of Gia's deceased stepsister. Detectives found a laptop and iPad in the room and took them in order to look at the hard drives. On July 29th, detectives located a video of Gia stopping at a coffee stand near Index called Espresso Chalet at around 11 a.m. on July 24th. They spoke with the owner who provided them with access to their DVR which had clips of Gia and her car. Gia's parents were present at the time to confirm the video showed their daughter. Here is the security footage that shows this incident. The video has no sound, but it is an interesting example showing Gia's erratic behavior at the time. The footage shows Gia perusing in a small outdoor shop at the chalet. Gia is in the red sweatshirt. She stands around a while before approaching a rack of Bigfoot keychains at the coffee stand. After struggling to get the keychains off the stand, it appears that Gia simply takes the whole row and walks off suddenly. The barista seems unsure about what to do. The owners of the chalet then approach and talk with the barista. During this time, it appears that Gia actually went to walk around on a short trail that surrounds the chalet. We next see Gia as she comes out of the woods and into the parking lot. She is no longer wearing her red sweatshirt and is being followed closely by one of the owners of the chalet. It appears the two are exchanging words. It is uncertain what was said, but eventually Gia gets in her vehicle.
At this point, both owners and the barista approach the car. Gia then tries to leave. The owners approach one more time, perhaps in an attempt to stop her, but she drives out of the coffee stand area in a hurry. On July 31st, detectives reviewed data found on the iPad that was taken from Gia's room at her home. In the iPad, they found a recent chat string between Gia and a man named Edward. It seemed to the detectives that the two may have been in a relationship, so they began following this as a potential lead. They were able to find and contact this Edward, a man who lived in Bellevue, Washington. He said he had recently met Gia at church and she became extremely clingy. He said that it appeared to him that she wanted a relationship, but he did not. He continued to talk with her via text, but had only met her in person once during church. He had been slowly attempting to stop communication and once Gia stopped sending him messages, he assumed that she finally got the clue. In reality, she disappeared. He said he had no idea where she may have gone. Detectives believed Edward's story and did not think he was involved in Gia's disappearance. The searchers that were on the ground actively looking for Gia every day spent much of their time on the outskirts of Highway 2, searching between Sky Comish and Stevens Pass. A canine searcher was deployed in the area where Gia's vehicle was found and was able to track her scent west towards Sky Comish for about one and a half miles until the scent abruptly stopped. Due to the thick forests in the area, helicopters were virtually useless when it came to searching from the air. Because of this, the entire search was essentially performed on foot. On August 1st, a SAR team was searching the steep hills in the area of Scenic and Surprise Creeks. This area is near to where Gia's car was found. At around 1 p.m. and about a mile up Scenic Creek, Searchers reported finding a trail of Gia's belongings on the ground, including her Bible, shoes, socks, notebook, jacket, Gia's iPhone, and a backpack. All of the items were found in a rather quick succession, almost like a trail of breadcrumbs leading up the mountain and following the path of Scenic Creek. Gia's name was written on some of the items, and the searchers realized she was wandering around the wilderness as there was no established trails in the immediate area. The detective on scene, Ed Christian, wrote about the discovery in his report, saying, On Saturday, August 1st, the search area that was being searched was a rugged and steep area just southwest of Highway 2. The eastern part of this area had been searched before, but with a low POD, probability of detection, due to the terrain and vegetation. At 12.42 p.m., a search team searching up Scenic Creek from US-2 located a set of Nike tennis shoes along with several Bigfoot keychains about three quarters of a mile up. This is a very steep ravine. At 2.36 p.m., searchers found Gia sitting on a rock in the stream. She was barefoot, only wearing jeans and a wet t-shirt. She was confused and incoherent. Her feet were scraped and cut up. Her shoes were brought up to her. She was then slowly escorted back down to base camp. At the time she was found, the only thing Gia could say was, I don't know where I am. A searcher told reporters that she hadn't eaten in so long she wasn't making any sense. An ambulance was sent to the rail yard off of Highway 2 near Scenic Creek to meet up with the SAR team that was en route with Gia. When they arrived, they took Gia to Evergreen Hospital in Monroe for treatment of cuts, scratches, and dehydration. Detective Christian's report continues. Her actions and appearance was consistent with somebody that had been trapped in a ravine for eight days. A huge contributing factor to her survival was the weather. She was found at 3,800 feet. There was a late snow melt and water was abundant in Scenic Creek. The weather during the week was very warm. 
The King County Sheriff's Office would say that it is extremely rare for someone to be found alive after such a length of time. Detective Christian, who had a long career involving many search and rescues, would say that he had only encountered one other case where an individual was found to still be alive after so long. Gia was reunited with her family, and despite being missing for around nine days, she was in remarkably good condition. Gia's case received widespread media attention, and afterward her mother was open to speaking with reporters. She told them that Gia thought she had only been lost for three days, showing that Gia lost her sense of time. Kristen Fuda said that when Gia ran out of gas, she pulled over and locked the door. Gia was apparently attempting to find a bridge to go over in Skykomish, but was on the wrong side of the road. She said she ran out of gas, just pulled over real quick, locked the door, got her stuff, and she walked down. She was trying to find a bridge that she was trying to go over um, in Skykomish, but she was on the wrong side of the road. And she thought she could hike up and find the bridge, and yeah, that didn't work out. This explanation, obviously, makes very little sense. I'm not sure if Kristen is saying that Gia was in Skykomish for the purpose of finding a bridge, or if she's saying that Gia was searching for a bridge after her car ran out of gas. Either way, Gia would have crossed numerous bridges in the Skykomish area to even get to where her car stopped, and there would be no logical reason to search for a bridge after her car broke down. All she needed to do was turn the car's emergency lights on and wait for help. I think this answer is indicative of the fact that even Gia Fuda is not sure why she did some of the things she did. Kristen Fuda would go on to say that Gia hunkered down and curled up in bushes at night to try and stave off the cold, which, even in the summer, can get pretty bad in the Cascades. Kristen said Gia survived off nothing but berries and water from Scenic Creek. Afterwards, Detectives talked about the possibility of doing an after-actions debrief interview with Gia, but would not require it. Her parents seemed interested in this type of interview, and they said they would talk to Gia about it. Like everyone knows, I mean, the outcome could have went either way. And for it to go this way, with being out there for that long and those elements, is just, it's a miracle. I'm sure many people are wondering if the detectives did, in fact, interview Gia after this incident. Yes, they did, so let's talk about it. On September 16th, 2020, two detectives visited Gia at her residence in Maple Valley to do the interview. She agreed to the meeting and was willing to answer questions. Detectives note she appeared to be doing great and was cheerful throughout. Her mother was also present for portions of the interview. Though the interview was not recorded, it was summarized in the report. Gia confirmed that her lost status was accidental and not on purpose. It was also not an attempt at self-harm. She said that once she ran out of gas, she just decided to walk into the woods for a while. She simply got lost. Gia acknowledged that she was in a low point at the time and was not feeling mentally well on that day. She was just driving and then walking with no specific plan or point. She just decided to keep climbing up once she was in the woods. She recalled the incident at the Espresso Chalet and confirmed she was probably acting bizarre there too. She confirmed that she neither saw, heard, or interacted with anyone during her time missing in the forest. She was thankful for everyone who assisted in finding her. What Gia has done with herself after the interview is uncertain. She no longer maintains any social media presence, unless she now goes by another name. Hopefully, she was able to find some peace and recover from her troubling ordeal. Gia's story has always fascinated me, and I've always been interested in visiting the area where it all happened. So in the late spring of 2023, I traveled to the North Cascades to see it for myself. On the way there, I stopped by the Espresso Chalet where Gia was seen in the surveillance video. 
The store is still there, and they still sell Bigfoot merchandise. Getting to the area where Gia was found is a bit unconventional. In other cases, there is usually some trail to follow to get to the place I am looking for. But in Gia's case, I traveled on Highway 2 until I came to a gravel turnoff. It is here that you encounter the rail yard and two other roads across from it. You basically have to just walk straight into the woods until you run into Scenic Creek, and then follow it up. The area is dense and steep, but altogether not difficult to navigate, as the creek is your trail in and out. Hey everyone, I'm actually sitting right next to Scenic Creek right now. It's been a goal of mine to actually come out here, but uh, forest fires last summer made it impossible. So we're here in late spring, and we hiked up to the area where Giafuda was found, or thereabouts. And as you can see, it's pretty isolated out here, but it's by a river or a creek. One of the interesting things about this case is that it kind of goes against what you would think would be logical for a missing person to do. Usually people say that a lost person would go downhill. Well, Gia went uphill, and intentionally, and she didn't know why she was doing it. This is kind of a unique case in that way, and shows that we can't always predict what someone is going to do when they're lost. Now, this case has always fascinated me, because she survived for nine days out here. Now, surviving for nine days anywhere is difficult, it's, even if you're thinking rationally and you know what you're doing. Gia was in some sort of fugue state, as evidenced by the footage we saw at the chalet. That was not her normal behavior, and everything about that video says something's not right. And after she left the chalet, she drove as far as she could east until she broke down or ran out of gas, and then walked west on the road a little while and then just walk straight up into the woods. It makes sense why the King County Sheriff thought there was some foul play here, because search dogs followed her trail west until it just stopped. And they must have thought she got picked up on the road, but no, she just went up into the woods. And she survived in this area for over nine days. That's pretty incredible. And it's really a miracle they found her on the last final day of the search, otherwise, who knows, she could still be out here to this day, and the ending could have been much more tragic. Because of that, this case is really unique. And this area, it's really interesting to be here. I've wanted to see it for a while. We're deep in the Cascades, and it's just this nice, isolated creek out here. So it's incredible that she survived out here for so long. If you followed the news reports of Gia's disappearance when this incident occurred, it probably left you with the impression that this was simply a girl who got lost. And the circumstances in which she was lost and found left many people feeling that something really strange had happened. There was never any mention of the incident that occurred at the chalet, except that Gia stopped there, purchased a Bigfoot keychain, and left. There was also no mention of the erratic behavior noted by her parents. This is likely not the fault of the news media, but rather the sheriff for only releasing certain details about the case. Now, having reviewed the case in full, it seems that mental health played a role. It begs the question about how many other cases there are where mental health played a role, but it was simply never publicized. Sometimes the lack of a key piece of information can leave the door open to some pretty wild speculation. Is it miraculous that Gia survived and was found? Yes, but she also had many things working in her favor. The weather, for one. It was the perfect time of year to be outdoors in the Cascades, though I still imagine the nights could get pretty cold. She also stayed near a water source. Some people seem to think that it's strange when missing people are found near water, but in reality, it's simply the smart thing to do. Water is absolutely essential for survival, especially when you're lost, and you should always stay close to some. In this case, 
It could have also led Gia to safety, but I don't think she was in the right state of mind to even consider that. I imagine her interest in staying near the water was more instinctual. When I was here, there wasn't any food to be had in the area, which is to be expected in early spring. I saw the blooms of many salmon berries and huckleberries, which I expect were what Gia ate when she was in the area. I also imagine some folks are wondering about the trail of clothing and items that Gia left. Paradoxical undressing is not something that applies in this situation due to the heat of the summer. The search team that found her said that her clothing was wet. I would assume she removed some of her clothing to stay cool and possibly even douse herself with water. Ultimately, many of the answers to any questions will never be known as Gia herself did not even realize she was missing for as long as she was. Kristen Fuda told reporters that her daughter thought she had been gone for only three days meaning she can't seem to recall entire days of being lost. Perhaps you could chalk this up to her mental state, stress, or starvation, but you can't be certain. The only one who knows the truth about what happened is the forests of the Cascade Range. And for now, they aren't talking. Until next time, thanks for watching.